Hello everyone and welcome to today's webcast, How to Design a Least Privileged Architecture in AWS, sponsored by AWS Marketplace. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Dave Shackelford, SANS Analyst, and Sagar Kosnis, Partner Solutions Architect at AWS. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface. We will be answering them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Dave. Hey, excellent. And thanks so much for joining us, folks. It's always a, a privilege, no pun intended, to be able to hang out with you guys and talk shop for a little bit about um, specific topics in the realm of cloud and what's happening out there. And as I think everybody is, is probably aware, the topic of today is all about least privilege. And uh, I've got a little bit of lag on my uh, changing slides, so sorry. I'm trying to get to the right place. So um, in any case, uh, I'm Dave, and uh, I am also happy to be joined by Sagar today. And we're going to be talking sort of between the two of us about not only some of the different controls and best practices around building least privilege in the cloud. So I'm going to start off with a brief overview, just, you know, really what does that mean? In the context of cloud, how are we looking at the concept of least privilege and, and maybe some of the very specific changes that we're seeing people actually enact within their cloud environment deployments. Then we're going to go into specific topics. So we're going to talk about identity management. We're going to get into some network design and some discussion around sort of where that fits in the scheme of least privilege. We're going to talk about uh, another couple of unique controls and control areas that are specific to the world of cloud and uh, look at some different types of use cases. Now, what's cool is there's also a lot of really interesting information that Sagar is going to be bringing to the table about, well, actual customers doing this right now in ways that I think will help everyone shape their own use cases and some of the different deployment strategies that they're coming up with and that you guys might be coming up with as well. So there's a ton of awesome stuff. Again, really excited to be here with you guys. And I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So um, thinking about the concepts of least privilege, I tend to find in webcasts like this, working with SANS for as long as I have, that um, you know most people are sort of comfortable with the topic, at least as far as least privilege from an overview perspective is concerned, right? Most of us have heard the term. We've run into that in, uh, in our travels along the way. And, um, you know, at least when we're talking about it casually, we, we get it, right? But here's the thing, just sitting and talking about it and actually turning it into something meaningful are wholly different <laughs> discussions in a lot of cases. And in fact, consistently implementing least privilege approaches has been really tough, especially as we've seen our organizations sort of sprawl in terms of size, in terms of technologies. Uh, you know, you've got just a, a natural inclination on the part of certain types of users and certain groups within organizations to, you know, perhaps have more privileges than are needed, but it makes the job easier. And that doesn't mean that anybody's trying to, you know, perform malicious or suspicious actions. It just means, well, they're trying to get the job done. But unfortunately, we've seen the ramifications of that over the years, right? So there's been plenty of cases over the years. Again, I won't bore everybody with all those examples. We all know them where, you know, again, unfortunately, those privilege allocations have led to later problems in a variety of forms. So it's, it's definitely easier to allocate more privileges right up front, right? Creating a, uh, an access limitation model takes more time and effort. And so, you know, again, simplicity and ease of use sometimes wins out. And the other thing that we've really seen is this incredible just breadth of privilege models across our technology stacks. That right there is one of the biggest issues, especially as we've got all these sort of disjointed technologies. We've got some legacy stuff. We've got, you know, obviously a lot of newer technology. And then the minute we move out into public cloud, well, we've got to embrace <clears throat> some of the cloud native and cloud provider privilege models and privileged services and tools as well. So, yeah, it seems daunting right up front coming up with least privilege access models and then successfully implementing those I think we've seen that struggle consistently for years, but when we start moving into the cloud, there are some new things that we definitely have to take into account, uh, and, and certainly some new different technologies that come along with that 
as well. So um, we're, we're rethinking some of this. And I've been uh, spending a lot of time, really I've spent about the past 10 years in my own career, um, you know, sort of yelling at everybody about cloud <laughs> from, you know, my own, my own little private soapbox, whether that's in a SANS class or in webcasts and, and presentations like this. And, you know, here we are, it's 2020, fantastic. I've definitely found that people have seen the light and they're moving to cloud uh, and, and looking for ways to bring that least privileged concept along with them. So we're really looking at a lot of different areas. And, and number one, I'd say, just revisiting the entire concept of perimeter. I, I think we have to just you know, get that one right out of the way first. And I'll address this in just a few moments with some specificity. I, I definitely want to get into the different areas that we you know, certainly want to talk to. But in the world of cloud, the term perimeter becomes a lot more nebulous. There are lots of perimeters. And so it's almost a misnomer to say that it's a vanishing perimeter. It's really a, a complete remodeling of what perimeter means altogether. So, you know, the classic models for security, we sort of had this, uh, you know, big, you know, network design where everything was encapsulated within this, you know, sort of bubble of the network. And then it was the, you know, things that were outside and the things that were inside. And then we realized, well, it's probably flat on the inside, so we need to start creating enclaves and, and trying to you sort of partition things off. I won't say that those concepts don't still apply. I think there are network perimeters, and there are the you know sort of idea of zoning that we can bring to the table. But of course, in the cloud, everything's a software-defined infrastructure, and actually, that gives us some new opportunities to redefine the perimeter too. So, in my view, the notion of how we build perimeters today or can build perimeters today is a positive step in the right direction. And as I said, I'll get to that here in just a moment. We've also got to take workloads into account. And the design of workloads and application architectures, you know, that's got to be on the table when we're having this discussion around privileges, number one, because every component that's part of an application, you know, sort of scenario, uh, maybe needs to have interoperability with various services or other components or different user contexts. And all of those cases require us to bring our notion of privileges that are needed and, of course, look at the least privileged model to the table. So we've got to bring this to the table every single time and start thinking about how we can build these uh, types of architectures and, of course, go to existing architectures and maybe either, you know, sort of re-retro, you know, kind of retrofit some of the uh, policies and permissions there, too. The notion of trust relationships sort of ties into all this. And, again, I'll, I'll sort of get into some thoughts around how those trust relationships manifest, specifically to cloud, in just a minute. But, you know, all those things combined bring us to what I look at as sort of the three pillars of a least privilege strategy for security professionals out there today. Number one, and right at the you know, sort of tip of this whole thing, is identity and access management. I've been saying this for a long time, and, and I've, I've just come to believe it more and more. Um, identity and access management is a must-have skill set and knowledge base for security professionals. And, and everybody has some of this, right? We've been dealing with an inordinate number of, of, you know, different sort of areas within identity and access management for a long time. But in the cloud specifically, everything is an object of some type, and all of those objects have their own identities. And so we've got a whole new way to really look at this and, and make sure that we're putting it into practice. Number two, well, it's still the network. So we've still got networking. We've just got different ways of implementing some of our network designs. And then finally, We've got this notion of something called cloud security posture management, or CSPM, if you want to use the you know sort of common acronym that's being thrown around out there in the industry. But whether you want to use an acronym like that or not, I mean, that's what everybody seems to be sort of calling it. It's really services oriented towards evaluating the cloud control plane as well. Because let's face it, the cloud is a software engine, and there are a lot of you know, knobs that we can turn and switches that we can flip. And we need to make sure we're keeping an eye on that as well. So between those three elements, we definitely have a lot to talk about. And as I've found, progressively, you know, the, the, the cloud, you know, certainly is moving along with us. And so we're going to see that there's a lot of newer services emerging, lots of changes that are happening out there. I'd say none of these concepts are really remaining static at all. So we're seeing sort of an evolution that's occurring in the realm of cloud as well. And, um, you know, again, that's, that's really a positive thing as long as we can just keep running <laughs> and keep up with this stuff. So let's start off with the big one, which is identity and access management. 
And as I said, really, this is pro you know I, this is really one of the most important things that any security professional needs to have a strong grasp of. And there's a whole lot to this. Now, uh, across the spectrum of IAM, you've got authentication, you've got authorization, you've got things like federated access model, um, you know, different types of, of access models that may uh, go along with things like your directory services or maybe more sort of web services enablement. You've got to define what those uh, kind of groups and services look like. And of course, IAM wraps around all of this. And so there's a couple specific things that I tend to find very important right out of the gate that organizations need to be addressing and really being considerate of as they start shifting into more cloud-based scenarios and deployment strategies. And I'd say the first thing, you know, again, right off the top of the bat, um, you know, you're going to find that, you know, in general, uh, there's certainly this concept of users. Now, uh, it's interesting. I, I was even having a conversation earlier on with some other SANS folks, and we were sort of talking about this term user <laughs> within the cloud because it takes on a bit of a different context. So a user is still a user. I mean, let's get it out there, right? If I'm Dave, and I have a user account for Dave, and there are privileges assigned, well, certainly I could log into my cloud console or go interact with cloud services as Dave, but really that's the less likely scenario. So um, every IAM user that you create is obviously an entity with credentials that's able to do something. So in that context, yeah, of course, this is sort of normal. I mean, as you would think of a user, but here's the thing. For the most part, you're not going to find that the IAM users that we integrate into the cloud are sort of your end users, right? It's not the vast majority of your employees that we're bringing in directory services. You can do that. And there are very specific cases for that where perhaps you have a large group that need to be mapped into a specific service role or something that can allow them into various types of services that you're running. But more than likely, what you'll find is that IAM users and the representation of those users, it's more for the definition of role assignments or service accounts or administration or operation types of tasks and orientation for, you know, say, the cloud engineering teams. And so I always sort of counsel people. I'm like, look, even if you're a big organization, you know, with thousands and thousands and thousands of employees, what you don't want to get into is a situation where you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of distinct sort of IAM type of users because that becomes very untenable to maintain. Instead, what you want to do is still continue leveraging things like directory services. And there are all manner of ways to synchronize your directory entities with cloud-native types of directory services to then make use of different cloud services there. So you've got all sorts of integration opportunities. But to start off, since we're talking about least privilege, most of the time that comes down to administrative types of users in a variety of ways. And so number one, each of the users within IAM starts with nothing. And this is just such a great thing that we've seen shift in the world of cloud is, is more of a you know sort of movement towards this deny all stance. Um, because we've been talking about it for years, but it really hasn't manifested. Well, in the cloud, it does. So you go spin up a user that it's intended to be sort of representative, uh, representative of an engineering task or service role, whatever the case might be. It starts with nothing. Then you have to specifically add exactly the explicit permissions that you want or need. And that, to me, is, is obviously a better model. Coming from a sort of a, a security purist standpoint, I guess, um, I think we can all agree that that's the orientation we've always wanted. And so as a starting point, that is a very good thing. So number one, when you're talking about users within IAM, realize that if you go back to your organization after this webcast and you're like, huh, let me go see what's going on in there. Um, well, there's a good chance that you, you've got uh, certain users that may not have an ideal least privilege model in place. But what that tells you is that people added that, <laughs> right? It started off with nothing. So that's, of course, something we'll get to here in just a minute as well. Um, number two, when we're talking about IAM, you really have to understand the uh, sort of relationships within the cloud. And I think this is a big, big stretch for a lot of folks that just haven't been deeply involved in cloud design and architecture. Right? A lot of security professionals just don't come from this background. And the good news is I, I think there's, there's a couple specific types, and you can really learn these pretty quickly. 
Number one is, you know, let, let, let's take the sort of end user roles, right? So I'll start with the third item here. You can federate your entire directory services grouping mechanism into the cloud and then assign those uh, types of privileges to different users and groups. Okay, cool. Now, in fact, to me, that is definitely the way to go for maintaining your directory because I think having a single source directory that everything is basically built from is still incredibly important. So for most of us today, that's things like on-premise active directory. You don't want to get away from that. You don't want to have things duplicated all over the place and trying to manage it all over the place. Uh, set up sort of the master you know, service directory or, or user directory and then sync anything from there off to places that you need that to go. And that's really something where we've seen an adoption of single sign-on and, you know, again, role assignments around that. So that, to me, is always the starting point. And, and you'll find that there's a variety of different identity service providers out there that you can take advantage of and, and sort of integrate with. But, again, there's a variety of different types of federation, some where you have things like SAML assertions, and that's more oriented towards, again, the sort of user directories and traditional enterprise directory services, whereas I've got a lot of different, um, you know, sort of mobile devices or applications that also need to be federated in, and that's where you might find more, you know, sort of, uh, you know, OAuth-based or token-oriented types of uh, service federation and, and access federation for authorization into different cloud services. So the last two bullets here, all about essentially integrating, where you're taking users or you're taking accounts or taking some sort of sort of entity representation that perhaps is external to cloud and bringing it in. But once you're there, you've still got to have some sort of a role or privilege assignment. Now, that means we've also got to think about what we're provisioning access to. Now, in the cloud, there tends to be a couple different forms of this. Number one would be things like AWS services that need to talk to each other. And there's a lot of these, especially as your deployments grow you're going to find that workloads, whether that's EC2 or whether that's container services or others, will need to talk to storage, for example. So I've got S3 buckets that need to be communicated with, or I've you know, got uh, different RDS databases over here. Well, internal to the cloud, everything is inextricably linked to the cloud provider's fabric. So AWS is conveying that service orientation from one service to the next. And the way that that is traditionally done internal to the cloud is through defining roles and privileges. Now, in a very large deployment where, let's say, you guys have broken things out across accounts. So I've got an account that's specific to my, uh, you know, marketing team. I've got an account that's specific to, uh, you know, my test or dev teams. I've got accounts that are specific to even the security team. Well, what does the security account need to get access to in these other accounts? You can create cross-account access relationships as well, and that's something I'll talk about here in a moment as well, because that brings some additional tools and different requirements in for mapping out those relationships and, again, looking for the opportunities to find least privilege type access models as well. So there's a couple types here. I know it sounds like a lot, but honestly, it's not quite as much as you would think. As long as you understand sort of where those are and how they're grouped together, that's really the approach you want to take. Um, now, looking at least privilege I am for the cloud, there's a couple things that I, I sort of say you should start with. So number one, focus on privileged users. So that's administrators, engineers, et cetera. Second thing you should look at is the deployment pipelines and any systems and services that go along with that. Now, there's a lot to be said out there in the world of DevOps and engineering, and there's a lot of sort of moving parts that go with that. A little bit beyond the scope of this webcast, but nonetheless, really important to make sure that you have assigned least privilege into things like service accounts if you're deploying from Jenkins or some other sort of, you know, sort of build strategy and, and so forth. The third piece that needs to be considered is those user service and application relationships that are within the cloud. So this is sort of an intra-cloud model, like I was just mentioning, where you've got workloads and storage that need to communicate, or you've got, you know, serverless functions that need to talk to some other sort of uh, other services in different places. And the final piece of this would be really going and looking at accounts coming from other accounts, you know, creating that sort of multi-account strategy. You really typically don't start with a multi-account strategy. It's something that you build out. And if you start with multi-account strategies and then have to go back and revisit all these other pieces, it can get really, really unwieldy. So this is, in fact, sort of a preferred order if you can do it. Now, I'm guessing that most of you out there don't have sort of a greenfield, net new cloud deployment strategy 
in front of you, right? Most of you probably already have things running in the cloud today. Doesn't mean that each one of these isn't, you know, obviously critical in those scenarios, but I tend to find more often that the bigger things that sort of bubble up to the surface as far as where the security attention is needed is more on that sort of intra-cloud type service orientation, right? The account-to-account -account strategies, you know, hopefully you don't have 5,000 accounts <laughs> all sort of mapping together because that's just hard to manage anyway. But nonetheless, looking at those relationships, um, you know, usually is, is a great starting point. And I'm very excited to say that we're seeing better tools come about and emerge. And the folks at AWS have given us a few that any of us in security can take advantage of immediately. And, and I've heard a lot of people in my classes just make the comment, you know, Dave, it, it feels like identity is, is complicated. Well, you know, there's the <laughs> maybe understatement of the year because it's the underpinning for everything. There's all sorts of policies and privileges, and there are a lot of nice out-of-the-box ones, right? So you can go into the catalog and pick a lot of them that are already well-defined and give you great starting points. But, you know, naturally you'll find that lots of organizations, in fact, I'd say most, need to perform some customization. And that's where things can start to sort of spin out of control if you have a lot of them. And so the more tools I have running in the environment that can help me figure out exactly what I've got access to and <clears throat> whether that conforms to a least privilege model, the better. So Access Advisor is one that's sort of a, I call it sort of the quick hit view of exactly what's there. In other words, I've got a group and I've got role assignments and policies that are assigned to that, but I can quickly flip over into my Access Advisor that tells me, hey, here's what the policies are that are assigned and here's the other services that they're tying to. Okay, cool, well that helps me because if there's an obvious service that's just sitting there, and I know there's no need for that, well, that's a quick sort of flashing indicator that I need to get in there and take a look at it. But uh, the newer tool, the service that's been created in the last year or so called Access Analyzer um, is just awesome. So this is a you know, massive scale backend analytics processing engine that you know, once you've got that enabled in there, just starts looking at everything and telling you where you've probably got some opportunities to reduce privileges, improve policy assignments, you know, it'll, it'll note obvious things within the whole context of IAM where maybe there's users or groups that aren't being accessed or used, there's, you know, sort of floaters or <laughs> like, uh, you know, maybe some zombie accounts you set up for a test scenario or something. This tends to naturally and organically happen in any cloud environment where people are building and there's a lot of dynamic movement. And so the more, again, services that are sort of sitting in the background, helping us out, really trying to, help, you know, really help us figure out across this whole spectrum what's there, that's great for us. And the cool thing is you can do this across accounts. You've just got all sorts of really useful capabilities that have come out of that. And I think anybody in security should be jumping in and making use of that immediately if you're not already. Now, that said, if you do have more than one account, you're going to need tools to help manage that, uh, especially at scale. And thank goodness... We do have tools out there like AWS organizations that allow us to create master and centralized types of policy deployments across the accounts. Because think about it, um, it it'd be total chaos <laughs> if every one of your business units and groups was trying to you know, uniquely and disparately manage all of their own services and policies, especially without a, a deep level of expertise technically in each of those groups. And so what's happened, especially in large organizations, where maybe you have different um, you know, geographic business units or just different groups that you want to break out across accounts, well, we've got organizations where we can now define what are known as service control policies or SCPs that are sent via invitation. So you invite the security team to be a part of the organization. You invite the marketing team or the sales team or the business development team, you know, wh whoever's got different accounts all get invited, you roll up under one sort of master organization, and these policies are then automatically propagated and put into place. And the only thing I, I tend to find you know, people asking about this is, well, who manages that? It's a great question. And there's no one answer to this, because I think it depends on the organization themselves to some degree. Again, no pun intended. But if you've got a central IAM team, that's going to be your best approach, right? You really want to have a unique organizational team that manages that so that you can, you know, sort of keep some semblance of control around it, if at all possible. But I've seen a lot of different approaches that may work. And the other argument people always have around multi-account architectures is, well, again, Dave, it's complicated. Well, yeah, it can be, certainly. And I think a lot of people struggle with where to start 
and how to think through this, right? What's the right design? How, what are the right accounts that I need to create and then manage and administer? Well, again, there's no one answer because it depends on you and your organization, but there's always some great sort of wisdom of the, the folks that have been doing this for a while. And the first model that AWS put out there was called the landing zone, which said, hey, look, here's sort of a starting point for you guys, right? Here's sort of like a, a, you know, a, a specific account or set of accounts that you can link together and, and sort of work with. But even that, I think, was really hard for people to just build and, and sort of maintain. And so a newer service that's come out called Control Tower can basically help you do a bunch of this in an automated way. And it's phenomenal because not only will you create the dis, uh, different accounts, uh, you know, what I, I sort of affectionately refer to as the starter pack of different accounts, but it's got all the guardrails in place with monitoring rules, uh, different definitions for infrastructure as code and cloud formation, um, the pre-built identity policies with restrictive permissions and privileges across the accounts, like all that's there already. And it, it sort of gives you exactly what you need to get going with this and then build on top of it. And I will tell you personally, I think this is one of the best services that's come out to help people get a, a handle around and, and start down the road of multi-account architectures and we've needed it. So exciting times, honestly, because uh, accounts are really the best sort of um, you know, isolation me mechanism that you can put together, at least in the world of identity. Um, so looking at least privilege on the networking side, well, network segmentation you know, mindsets and strategies still come into play here. But you're also going to start running into the term micro-segmentation, which is sort of a least privilege model that gets a bit closer to the workloads themselves and ideally prevent things like lateral movement and other sorts of attack strategies that are, you know, maybe somebody compromised one workload or a service. Well, we don't want them to go anywhere, so we want to limit that as much as we can. And within the context of networking, our, our sort of master, you know, sandbox is what's known as a VPC or virtual private cloud. And there's a whole lot of fascinating technology that sort of supports that going down into virtualization infrastructure and hypervisors. But within the context of that VPC or that sort of sandbox, we also have some cloud native types of uh, access controls and isolation controls that we can make use of. And these, of course, have their own pros and cons and, and sort of benefits and drawbacks depending on what you want to use, right? So there's, no, there's not always a good time to use just a security group or a network access control list or network ACL. You sort of need to understand how they fit within the, the sort of bigger picture. And so, you know, again, explaining these, and this is sort of a breakdown, and I won't, you know, read this all out to you guys. Some of you may be aware of this, but this is some useful information just in terms of how they differ. The security groups really apply to workloads. So they, they're sort of like a policy wrapper, really, of network access control that you can really very granularly define stateful uh, policies with, whereas network ACLs, or more at that subnet level, and it's you know things like explicit allow or deny for known good or known sort of you know suspect or malicious IP addresses or network zones. So you can make use of both of these, but the best practice overall is to use security groups mostly, right? As as sort of your definitions for things, um, and then really sort of use uh, network ACLs sparingly because you know you're probably not going to have that many really explicit allow or deny situations that you want to kind of track and keep up with. Now, what I tend to find uh, working with especially larger enterprises is that the cloud native network security is great and you're going to use it extensively. There's no question whatsoever. But there's a pretty good chance that you may have some compliance requirements or some additional network security needs um, that aren't met necessarily by those. And that's okay. That's not really what they were built for. Um, you've got a huge variety today of next-gen firewall platforms and more advanced sort of application tier systems that can give you intrusion detection and prevention, you know, do deep traffic inspection and monitoring, and also may roll back to more of a centralized model of configuration and operational maintenance. Um, so again, if you're already using some of the different types of platforms out there and you've got a good, uh, you know, sort of comfort level with those third-party service providers, you know, those guys are in, available in your AWS environment, too. So fantastic. Again, it's nice to have some consistency across that. 
Now, looking at the architectural strategy for performing this, you know, sort of isolation or segmentation with the networking, you know, you got to make decisions. Am I going to use a number of VPCs to link together, or am I going to use subnets? And if you use VPCs, I mean, uh, I need to create peering relationships between one VPC and another to allow them to communicate. And what we found over the years is that VPC peering can really get complicated too, especially in large, sprawled organizations with lots of accounts and lots of things that need to be able to communicate. And so there's a lot of really cool technologies emerging here as well to facilitate more of a, you know, sort of call it a, a hub and spoke or a centralized model where we can create everything coming in to some sort of a zone where maybe one VPC has most of our sort of ingress and primary egress controls. And then we can have that peered to a number of places through one central control model. And in particular, transit gateways can simplify multi-VPC architectures and allow for that to be uh, a lot more manageable over time. So again, everything comes in to maybe a single VPC, goes through a transit gateway to get to everywhere else. And that's actually a highly sustainable model that can also take advantage of third-party platforms and tools and other services that we want to integrate there, right, next-gen firewalls and the like. The third and sort of final pillar that I want to touch on here, and a really important one, honestly, um, because, again, there's a lot of surface area with all of the configuration options and services that you may have running within the cloud control plane, something's got to keep an eye on that, too. <laughs> and we do have a lot of ways to get that internally to the cloud using event data and all sorts of other tools. And again, that's a little beyond the scope of this if we're talking about event monitoring and such. But fortunately, there's an entire new realm of tools and services called CSPM for posture management. You know, in other words, configuration and assessment of the configuration of the cloud. And we can continually monitor the exact state that we want to have in place. So I know I want these particular configurations. I know I want these specific types of policies, I know I want these specific types of services turned on or turned off, something can keep an eye on that for us and make sure that we're building and maintaining that cloud control platform in the manner that we desire. So again, this is another area that definitely has to tie into least privilege as an element of, you know, are we maintaining it that way? So um, in looking at a least privilege use case and sort of what, what's the end goal here? What are we trying to get to? I'd say any organization planning on pushing things out into, you know, PaaS environments or infrastructure service environments, um, you know, you need to focus on least privilege by starting off with the identification of roles and responsibilities for any team members that require the access. And this is predominantly your privileged users that are involved in engineering and DevOps and administration, anybody that's going to be able to start things, stop things, or change things in the cloud proper. So that's the first thing you got to do. And for a large organization, that could be a lot of work just to get to that and really define carefully who needs access to what and why. Number two, you need to think about the types of network access that are needed. In other words, is it predominantly coming from the internet where, you know, again, you've got mostly end users accessing services. Do you have a dedicated network connection in a hybrid format, you know, between your premises and Going out into AWS, you've got, uh, you know, again, a, a direct connect connection there where you've got everything, you know, sort of connected all together all the time. Or are you going to be having more occasional access or using things like IPsec tunnels? Well, once that connection's thought of, where is it going to land? So you've got to think about zones. And again, the best practice here is to define critical entry and exit zones where you have all the various types of security scrutiny that you would normally have. And then internally, you might leverage things like microservice types of access controls in more cloud-native uh, ways. So you've got a lot of different options altogether. Now, you need to make sure that as you're defining those least privileged roles between services, between accounts, potentially between federation ingress, that you're leveraging those cloud-native services, um, you know, Access Advisor and, and, you know, the Analyzer tools to really look at what's really there. It's very easy to make assumptions and say, well, this looks like a great least privileged policy, but is it? Is it really? Make sure you're leveraging the tools that are uh, provided there. And then, of course, put some sort of monitoring around the cloud control plane, especially as your deployment gets bigger and, you know, sort of more advanced. You're going to have more things in place and enabled. And, you know, that's something where it's very easy, once again, to lose sight of it without a continuous monitoring strategy. So. 
in, in sort of looking at the next things to take away here, I mean, really, I'd say the, the you know, sort of summary of our approach should definitely uh, start with user and administrative access. You definitely want to make sure, especially as you're a big organization, that you might be using multi-account identity management. You're looking at cross-account uh, roles and cross-account privileges. And look at those network architecture and access controls, again, in, in sort of a multi-pronged way. You've got things like next-gen firewalls and platforms that are going to provide that sort of deep layered security where you can put those into different zones that control anything coming in and coming out, as well as between zones as well. And then you've got those microservices types of policies and controls that are deeply embedded into the cloud fabric themselves and, again, give us that sort of intra-cloud type of access control too. Once things are up and running, um, again, at a certain point, you're definitely going to find that a posture management tool starts to make a lot of sense as well. And, you know, again, that's more to make sure that you're keeping track of the cloud control plane in its own right. And now I'm excited to pass things off to Sagar, who's actually going to give you guys some really cool use cases and examples. Sagar, take it away. Awesome. Um, thank you, Dave. That was some great guidance on least privilege architecture design. Um, so my name is Sagar Kostnis, and I'm, I'm a partner solutions architect for AWS Marketplace. Uh, and I've been in the technology space for about 10 years now and have been a consultant as well as architect in, in various roles uh, over these years. Uh, and today I, I work primarily with AWS customers who are asking how they can run their cloud operations in the most effective way possible. And almost every time when I help our customers design solutions, I hear a lot of questions like, great, now we have designed a solution. Uh, how do we control access to this infrastructure in our company of thousands of users? And, and, and that's because identity is such a foundational concept um, in architecture design um, on the cloud. Uh, and really based on these interactions, I'd like to spend some time talking about how you can design a least privileged architecture in AWS. So today we'll be looking at a quick snapshot of AWS services that you can use. Uh, a lot of these that Dave has uh, already touched upon. Uh, some solution sellers in AWS Marketplace. Uh, and then finally, how customers are finding success uh, with these solution sellers. Now, at AWS, you might have heard this, uh, but 90% of what we build is basically driven by what customers tell us um, they need. Uh, and really, based on those requests, uh, we, we're continuously innovating and releasing new services and features for our customers. Now, there's a number of AWS services you can look at for network segmentation as well as least privileged architecture. Uh, but today we'll look closer at uh, just a few of those uh, which are most important, namely uh, AWS Identity and Access Management, uh, AWS Firewall Manager, and also Amazon VPC Traffic Mirroring. Let's start with uh, AWS IAM. So uh, Identity and Access Management, um, uh, as Dave mentioned, enables you to manage access to all of your AWS services and resources securely. Uh, it is a foundational service. It works with all of our uh, AWS services. Uh, and with IAM, you can start to create and manage AWS users as well as groups and roles um, and use our construct of permissions to allow and deny all of the access to um, AWS resources to these IAM entities. Now, IAM is a feature of your AWS account offered at no additional charge. Um, Dave has also mentioned that, uh, you know, if you're using AWS organizations, you can use our uh, the construct of service control policies to make sure that you can add restrictions to particular services uh, inside of your uh, AWS account feed. So, for example, if you're not using um, uh, AWS uh, database services in your environment, and if you want to lock them down, you can define a service control policy which locks it down uh, across the fleet of AWS accounts in your uh, organization. So, so that's how you can start to use um, uh, AWS organizations. Now, when you look at network segmentation, we have a service called AWS Firewall Manager. 
Uh, and this is really a security management service which allows you to centrally configure and manage firewall rules uh, across all of your accounts and applications. Um, this will allow you to easily enforce a common set of rules uh, as, as you create new op applications in your environment. And then with Amazon VPC traffic mirroring, you can start to monitor traffic that flows into and out of your Amazon EC2 instances within your virtual private clouds. VPC traffic mirroring can also create a copy of inbound as well as outbound traffic to your network inf interfaces uh, so that you can start to look at these traffic flows with a much deeper lens and, uh, and inspect them uh, based on your requirements. Now, that was a quick snapshot of native AWS services you can look at for building your least privileged architecture. Now, let's double click on some of those. So Dave mentioned that organizations need to successfully map their cloud user as well as service relationships so that they can create the most restrictive privilege models needed. Even our customers have kind of told us that when they say, uh, hey, we have hundreds and thousands of AWS accounts and identities, how can we start to analyze which user has what kind of access? So keeping that in mind, we've also launched a feature within IAM called IAM Access Analyzer. You can start to use this tool to further enhance visibility uh, into all of the IAM policies that you've defined across your resources. Um, and how this really helps is your security teams and administrators can then quickly validate all of the policies uh, that, that you've designed inside of, uh, of your environment uh, and make sure that you're only providing the intended public as well as cross-account access to all of your resources. You can also start to easily define and refine uh, all of these policies as you go and as you learn more about uh, which services are being used in, inside of um, your environment. And really at the end of the day, uh, it helps you adhere to uh, the principle of least privilege. Now, apart from just identity and access control, we also looked at how network segmentation uh, is an important part of least privileged architecture. So let's dig into VPC traffic mirroring, uh, something that I'm personally very excited about. Uh, this is a fairly newer feature that, that you can start to use with your existing VPCs. Uh, and what you can do is you can capture, inspect um, uh, all of your network traffic at scale, right? So when you're implementing network segmentation within your environment, you can start to leverage VPC traffic web mirroring to make sure that uh, you, know, you en enhance the monitoring of traffic patterns as well as flow within your environment. Now with mirroring, you can start to take any traffic that flows into your network of Amazon EC2 instances, copy it, and then send it to an outside source for further inspection and threat monitoring. This mirror target can be within the same VPC as the source of the traffic, or uh, it, it can be in a completely separate VPC if you have a transit gateway set up in your environment. Now, this feature can also help with network segmentation efforts by further enabling uh, all of the inbound and uh, outbound traffic to be inspected uh, and, and really allow you to hone in on specific areas of your network while maintaining the same holistic visibility uh, in your environment. Now, AWS services are a great way to look at your identity and network segmentation requirements, but we also work with third-party sellers to ensure that you have options around the services and feature sets that you're looking for. So with that in mind, let's switch gears a bit and, and see how you can leverage some of our solution seller offerings to design a least privileged architecture. Now, the first seller I want to talk about is Palo Alto Networks. Um, all of the AWS customers that, that I work with are leveraging solutions uh, provided by Palo Alto Networks. And uh, from, from what I see, um, you know, they're really helping all of the customers with effective network uh, segmentation. So if you're looking for something like application layer monitoring, uh, they have a product called VMCD's Next Generation Firewall, which provides complete visibility into traffic all the way through layer seven. Now, 
once you deploy this product, you can start to create custom policies for inbound as well as outbound network traffic within your environment. Uh, and, and these are typically to help with uh, identifying potentially malicious activity that may pose uh, a risk to your environment. Um, and you know, you, with, the, with these policies, you can also start to filter um, all of your traffic by source, uh, if you're looking at user groups, um, as well as additional parameters uh, such as user IDs uh, and user access. Now, there, there's also other ways to remediate findings, uh, such as using findings uh, to further your, uh, to further strengthening your firewalls using this product. Uh, and, and one thing we've seen is this can be done directly or managed in one central location through something um, they call as Panorama. So Panorama allows you to layer firewall policies so that you can create granular permissions to segment all of your network traffic. Uh, and as we touched upon in the last slide, uh, you can start to enable things like Amazon VPC traffic mirroring to further uh, your investigations and enhance your segmentation uh, and security controls. Now, another great Palo Alto Networks product, uh, Prisma Cloud can enable continuous monitoring, build policy guardrails, and also detect any anonymous um, IAM activity to quickly identify compromised developer credentials, um, look at things like malicious insider activity, as well as other suspicious behaviors uh, in your environment. So uh, really, let's look at an actual customer who, uh, who's using Prisma Cloud um, by Palo Alto Networks. So Western Asset Management um, are, are a global fixed income investment firm. And uh, what they're trying to do is they're currently trying to innovate uh, within their space by moving their DevOps to the cloud uh, so that they can enhance their speed as well as quality of investment decision making uh, and and really to in order uh, to, to make sure that they can manage risk and compliance uh, in the new cloud environment they turned to this product called prisma cloud by palo alto networks now once they deployed the prisma cloud uh, it gave them immediate insight into their environments in um, uh, in ways such as uh, if, if you look at uh, your environments and if you have a lot of administrator accounts, uh, you, you usually have a lot of requirements around these. So uh, they had requirements around multi-factor authentication for the admin accounts. Uh, and this allowed them to see which admin accounts did not have MFA enabled. Uh, another thing that it did was it, it removed the need to rely on manual methods of getting log data uh, into all of their systems to analyze. Uh, and instead of that, it now provides them with a view that allows all of their teams to prioritize as well as pinpoint where the risks exist, as well as uh, allows them to really manage them um, uh, much faster than, than they were previously. So, so really, after implementing Prisma Cloud, uh, they're now able to get full visibility into their entire cloud infrastructure, uh, and they can look at both internal as well as external threats. Now, let's look at one more customer who's using Palo Alto Networks uh, in a successful manner. So First National Technology Solutions is, is really an IT solutions and uh, a services provider for uh, businesses. Um, they were really looking at three main things here. So the first thing they were trying to do is they were trying to expand their network security capabilities across multiple environments. At the same time, they wanted to make sure that they align information security with micro segmentation policies. And then finally, they also needed all of these policies to consistently scale uh, while up upholding their security requirements. Now, to meet all of these three requirements, they implemented VM series uh, next generation firewall, uh, and really they were able to automate protections across all of their multiple networks as well as infrastructures. Uh, one thing that this solution helped them do is create a centralized view of all activity across their networks as well as endpoints while uh, consolidating all of their policy management. Additionally, uh, this firewall helped them create policies that segmented both 
inbound as well as outbound network traffic, which was really important for their security team, uh, while also restricting lateral movement between networks. Now, one more benefit they saw was that uh, they could now automatically deploy all of their solutions. And really, when, when you have multiple accounts and multiple environments, automation of, of these solutions um, becomes an extremely important uh, uh, step in your environment. So they were able to automate that as well uh, and really start to see a lot of benefits uh, using that automation. And really at the end of this, uh, this led to enhanced security uh, alongside speed and scalability of their uh, network deployments. So that was Palo Alto Networks and how they helped customers achieve network segmentation. Um, let's look at a, uh, one more solution seller called Aviatrix and how they are helping customers in a much similar fashion. Now, Epsilon is a subsidiary of a global advertising and public relations company, uh, and they develop a suite of products and services that help transform uh, their customer experience. So to deliver top quality service to their um, multinational customer base, uh, they're using an AWS backed global cloud infrastructure with numerous dedicated application environments. Now, when you have a vast number of application environments, you obviously have a lot of VPC connections, your network is spanning across multiple environments, uh, and it usually means that security needs to be scaled and managed without manual operation. And on top of this, the customer also requires simplicity and orchestration, uh, visibility, as well as control for their AWS transit networking. And when you look at a privilege standpoint, uh, they needed to implement access privileges such as remote desktop privileges, uh, multi-factor authentication, as well as SAML authentication for, for the active di directory um, access. So a lot of specific complex requirements there. Um, but really, once you start to unpack some of these requirements, you, you realize how uh, easy it was for uh, something like Aviatrix to, to go and solve it. So um, once Epsilon started look, uh, looking at uh, Aviatrix secure networking platform, um, since Aviatrix is a cloud native vendor, uh, they were able to take advantage of the native AWS constructs while adding in their automation um, uh, into their environment. and. Uh, really they were also able to get secure connectivity for the encrypted application environments uh, along with a client-based SAML authentication. Uh, they saw other benefits too such as touchless pr provisioning, uh, automation capabilities uh, and really allowed Epsilon to streamline their onboarding experience uh, for their customer environments and, and on top of this is really also cut down their deployment costs. So um, all in all a beneficial solution for uh, for the customer. And uh, if you look at the whole picture, uh, the Aviatrix platform really provided the customer with enhanced visibility uh, into their network health, which they didn't have previously, um, and also provided performance metrics on each VPC connection, uh, it, you know, which is scaled up to a global infrastructure. So um, a really comprehens comprehensive solution there. And then we have one last solution seller called Edgewise, who's helping a customer with zero trust auto segmentation. Now, Vonage is a telecommunications provider for voice over IP protocol. Um, what they were looking to do is to enhance their security practices to restrict lateral uh, threat movement across all of their many disparate networks. Uh, and, and really to uh, accomplish this, they decided to implement micro segmentation within their network. Um, they did that to really cut down on lateral movement of, of traffic um, and, and doing so in a traditional way created a tremendous increase in uh, complexity. So, so they really needed to find a way to automate their micro segmentation. To solve this challenge, Vonage turned to uh, the zero trust auto segmentation solution from um, our solution seller, Edgewise. Uh, and how this solution helped is, is that it quickly implemented micro segmentation policies by using uh, machine learning to define the current segments with the customer uh, and really gain an in-depth understanding of what their normal patterns are, right? So to, uh, 
it's very important to understand normal tra traffic pa patterns if you if you're looking to take actionable um, uh, insights out of them. And and then once in place, uh, Edgevoice was able to map Warner's entire network environment, which also included uh, about 25 to 35,000 rules, uh, which is huge. Uh, and they really did this in a span of 20 minutes um, as compared to a previous mapping time of two months. So huge time saving savings there. Um, additionally, they were also able to quickly adapt to network changes across any of the customer's global locations. And when you're working in a global environment, you would see that uh, all, there would be a lot of uh, constant changes in, in the environment. So um, really the solution adapts to that also. Uh, and, and as a result of all of that is that the security teams at Vonage are now focusing on their business objectives and, and not really focusing on things like manual configuration of, of policies and, and making sure whether specific areas are um, implemented um, uh, correctly or not. So uh, again, automation keeps popping up, but it is an important piece um, in, in network segmentation. So those were some of the benefits of um, our solutions, uh, of, of how our solution sellers provide uh, benefit to our customers. And uh, since we spoke about all of these solution sellers in the least privilege and, and networking space, um, it's only natural to talk about AWS Marketplace and, and how it can help you. So why AWS Marketplace? Uh, and, and before that, let, let's understand what is AWS Marketplace for those of you who don't know. Um, AWS Marketplace is essentially a digital software catalog that has cloudified how to procure and license software. Um, we build this in order to reduce friction of deploying software into your AWS environment. Now, for example, if you're looking for automating your network segmentation, uh, instead of reinventing the wheel yourself, you can start to use AWS Marketplace to first discover multiple solutions, look at reviews by customers, just like you would do um, on an e-commerce site, and then uh, run a few trials to see which solutions make sense for you. And then once your team, um, your security team uh, are convinced that you know a particular solution works for your custom requirements, then you can go ahead and select that particular solution uh, to fit your needs. Uh, and really there's thousands of independent uh, software solution sellers uh, available on AWS Marketplace today. Now, uh, one of the cool things we were able to do is enable software to be bought in a much cloud-like way. So for example, if you're buying a firewall, you're typically buying a license for a year in your current environment. Um, and if you're, in, if you're working in an elastic environment where you need to scale up or scale down based on demand, um, you need to have that flexibility, right? Like you don't wanna go ahead and pay for your max uh, predicted usage where uh, when you can pay for something that uh, uh, that is available pay as you go so so really with marketplace we've made pay as you go um, as an option for you so uh, you, you could possibly buy two annual licenses and uh, uh, you know when it comes to uh, a time of the year where you need to scale up you can just pay for the hours that you use instead of provisioning for for your max throughput and, and we also have a team of solutions architects that uh, support AWS Marketplace and, and products within it. Um, and, and they can really help you ask the right questions and, and get connected to sellers um, that can solve your problems. Now, there's, um, there's hundreds of uh, sellers currently available, as I said. Uh, on this slide, we've listed a few, um, few of the security vendors in uh, AWS Marketplace that you can get started with. And um, th there's really a wide variety of pricing options available. So uh, when you look at pay as you go, as I mentioned, it helps you with uh, uh, you know, options such as hourly, monthly, and, and also annually. Um, if you're mi migrating to AWS and want to take uh, some tools that currently exist in your environment, uh, you can start to look at um, the option that we provide as bring your own license. So you can really start to take some of the current licenses. Um, like for example, if you're using Demisto, you could move it over to AWS and use your current license there. And then we've also uh, provided things like private offers, where if you want to use a negotiated uh, offer for um, 
that, that you currently have with your seller and don't want to pay that public price, you can start to use private offers to, to make sure that you're uh, getting the best price available for, uh, for your seller. Now, we've also simplified deployment and we support things like Amazon EC2 images, uh, containers using Amazon ECS, EKS, as well as machine learning models and algorithms that are sold by uh, third-party sellers. So a lot of options available there, including SaaS. Um, you can start to purchase all of this through AWS Marketplace. And you know, the, one of the biggest benefits is also that you will see all of these bills come up to your AWS account as a consolidated bill. So to summarize, there's really a variety of solutions available in AWS Marketplace uh, that could easily integrate in your AWS environment and uh, help you protect your AWS footprint. And um, we, we spoke to a few uh, sellers uh, like Palo Alto, Edgewise, um, and Aviatrix in our uh, platform because they are uh, really releasing new solutions as we go uh, in the AWS Marketplace um, environment. So you can start to look at these solutions um, in case you are uh, looking to get started quickly uh, and uh, use some of our deployment methods to make sure you're, um, uh, you can deploy um, you know, in different mechanisms that are available, including containers and, and machine learning. So. Um, Really, that that was about it from from my end, and um, you know we are really excited to help you tackle all of these challenges. And uh, at the end of this, you will receive a survey where you can let us know uh, if you'd like to talk security. So really, thank you uh, for for your attention, and and really appreciate your uh, your attendance today. Thank you from uh, AWS Marketplace.